So uh, we're very uh, pleased today to welcome uh, Stephen Ruggles, uh, who's professor uh, at uh, the University of Minnesota. Um, for most of us, all of us, uh, you know, we live, uh, it's not just the best of times, something else. In terms of data availability, it really is the best of times. Those of us who uh, started our careers when data uh, were less available, um, you know, from time to time it's just uh, jaw-dropping what, 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 what we can do, how we can see the world now. Um, if uh, I have one thing to say about it, um, even though everything that exists around us seems natural, there's nothing natural about it. Uh, it uh, um, evolved in a certain way. Uh, we'll learn a little bit about that today. It could go away. If people want to uh, come to the uh, wine and cheese at five or something this afternoon, uh, late afternoon, uh, our speaker, Amir Mahela, will talk a little bit about that. But uh, in terms of just the uh, action involved, we owe an incredible uh, debt of gratitude uh, to Steve for his uh, vision. He's the creator of any number of institutions, uh, most well known perhaps as IPUMS, and the things that house it, including the Minnesota Population Center and other uh, centers at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Steve has been um, um, either amply burdened or rewarded as recompensed by any number of uh, professional uh, honors, including uh, being uh, past president of the Population Association of America. I think he just stepped down as our Association of Population Centers president. He's about to rotate into the presidency of the Social Science History Association. Um, it's just with a little bit of local conceit that I'll say none of this would have been possible <laughs> uh, were he not, best of all, a PhD uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. Steve, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, first I want to acknowledge my co-author Diana Magnuson from Bethel University. Uh, and I, I hope this uh, goes better than the last time I was uh, presented at this seminar, which was 35 years ago. And I uh, presented a chapter from my dissertation on the economics of the extended family in the 19th century. And well, I guess the economists in the room didn't agree with my characterization of Gary Becker. But, but in any case, um, this is going to be a little different from your normal demography seminar. I'm going to give a, a narrative here. Uh, I'm going to trace the history of, of, of data capture in the U.S. Census. And data capture uh, we define as the methods and technologies used to transform raw census responses into something, uh, into statistical tables, basically. Uh, and so, um, Oh, I can use this thing. Uh, so uh, uh, we have an argument. Uh, we argue that uh, uh, for more than, more than a century, the, the Census Bureau was the uh, leading edge of data processing and was responsible for the major innovations that took place in that period. Uh, uh, but throughout the, the uh, census, uh, political considerations uh, determined not just the uses of the census and the content of the census, but also the technology of data capture. Um, and since the 1990s, the privatization of data capture has been a disaster, uh, leading to rapidly escalating costs, reduced productivity, and near catastrophic failures of the recent censuses. So uh, we divide the history of census data capture into five eras, uh, uh, and we will start with decentralized uh, um, uh, tabulation. So James Madison, as you all know, was the architect of the Constitution. What you may not know is that he was also the architect of the first census, the 1790 census, and he proposed two census schedules. One was a demographic schedule that had five questions on it for each household. Number of adult men, number of, of, of men under 16, number of, of, of free women, number of uh, slaves, and number of all other persons that would be free blacks. 
Uh, and then he proposed an occupational schedule uh, that uh, would specify the number of persons employed in different professions and arts, including merchants, mechanics, and manufacturers. And the occupational schedule was defeated in the Senate amid concerns that it would excite the jealousy of the people and was just gratifying an idle curiosity. Uh, Madison wrote to Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, who the Secretary of the State at the time was also the director of the census. Uh, 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 he wrote, it was thrown out of the Senate as a waste of trouble and supplying materials for idle people to make a book. <laughs> So this is what the census form looked like. This is the, the uh, enumeration, uh, a, a page of enumeration of Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, and as you can see, there was no printed census form until 1830. It was hand, hand uh, written uh, and everybody just got whatever paper they could get and they drew these, these lines on it. But the columns were the columns that were specified by Madison. Uh, and and it, it was a highly efficient design. So you could see uh, each, each row is, is a household and the head of household's name, the head of family name is, is on the left. So the first one is William Woody and he lives in a household with one adult male, that's the first column, and one one free adult uh, 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 female, uh, so probably his, his wife. And then the second row is another William Woody, uh, and he also has a household with one adult male and one female, but also has five uh, uh, males under the age of 16. So that's probably, he's probably the son of the first William Woody, and those are, are the grandkids. Um, and so that's the way it works. But uh, the, the efficient design is uh, the, uh, the way it's tabulated. Uh, uh, this at the top is brought over. That's brought over from the previous page. And so this is a running total of the number of people uh, in each category. That's slaves over on the right. Uh, and then down at the bottom, uh, you have, uh, they update it. You know, you just sum uh, the, 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 the total down there. And then you bring that forward, those numbers, uh, over to the next page. And so basically this, this, um, this meant that the tabulation was done by the assistant marshals. They're the ones that actually collected the census. Uh, and uh, they just then had to send the totals to Washington and, and Thomas Jefferson could have one clerk just uh, add up uh, uh, the, the, the totals uh, for each place uh, so you get totals for each county and each state and so on. Uh, and uh, 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 it was uh, very cheap to process. Well, between 1790 and 1840, uh, the census grew dramatically. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, Timothy Dwight, the president of Yale, uh, John Quincy Adams, and, and, and other people pushed for more and more questions. Uh, and so the 1840 census had 80 columns. So it went from five columns up to 80 columns. And they covered um, a lot of topics. There's, on the left there, there's five-year age groups for the, the, the free population. Uh, and because, uh, you know, they thought, they thought age distribution was a good measure of mortality. Um, they didn't quite get it, but um, uh, but anyway, they had some occupational classifications in here, uh, various literacy, different things. Uh, uh, but uh, the, um, uh, uh, the 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 columns are just three eighths of an inch wide, and people often got things in the wrong column, and this created some some problems. The most notorious of which was the questions on insanity, insane or idiotic. And here's a close up of those questions. Uh, uh, on on the left, there's two columns for uh, insane and idiotic whites. And then on the right, there's two columns for insane or idiotic uh, 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 colored people. And so when the tabulations came out, it turned out that the farther north you went, 
the higher the incidence of insanity. Uh, and, and this, of course, was used for uh, justification for slavery. Here we have a prevalence rate, which in a form you might be more familiar with. Uh, and you could see it was, it was really a stunning uh, difference. And, and if I put in the other states, you would see that it is a continuous, it is a continuous thing. The farther away you get from the Mason-Nixon line, the more the insanity goes up. So uh, John C. Calhoun uh, uh, noted that in all instances in which the states have changed the former relation between the two races, the condition of the African, instead of being improved, has become worse. They've invariably sunk into vo vice and pauperism, accompanied by the bodily and mental, mental afflictions incident thereto, including insanity and idiocy to a degree without example. Here is proof of the necessity of slavery. The African is incapable of self-care and sinks into lunacy under the burden of freedom. Well, a guy named Edward Jarvis, he was a physician and statistician, he, he, he took a little closer look. Uh, and he discovered that most of the New England towns re reporting colored insane population actually had no colored population. <laughs> uh, and so what was happening was that because there were so few blacks in the north, if you just had some random error where you get uh, things in the wrong column, since there's almost nobody in the denominator, you get uh, a few people randomly in the numerator because uh, they marked the, the colored column instead of the white column, uh, um, and uh, you get these uh, these horrendously high insanity rates. <coughs> so um, uh, Jarvis concluded that if you look at it in detail, uh, uh, the, the, the numbers on insanity on the very phase of it uh, uh, carries its own refutation. Uh, and he argued that it would have been far better to have had no census at all than such a one as has been published. And then um, uh, John Quincy Adams, former president, who was then in the House of Representatives, he, he wrote in his diary, Calhoun writhed like a trodden rattlesnake on exposure of his false report to the House that no material errors have been discovered in the census of 1840. So, this created uh, a need to redesign the census. Uh, so we move on to the tabulation bottleneck. Uh, and so uh, a census board was appointed. It included Jarvis, among others, uh, to recommend changes in the design of the census to avoid this kind of problem in the future. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, um, they came up with this form. Uh, and so they went from 80 columns down to 13 columns. But they got much more detail in here. They've got specific occupations. Uh, that's a malt manufacturer at the top there. Uh, and they've got value of real estate. He's worth $50,000. Uh, birthplace, uh, and, and you've got literacy, you've got school attendance, you've got, and of course, whether deaf, dumb, blind, insane, idiotic, pauper, or convict. Uh, and uh, you've got all this detail, single years of age. Uh, but the way you do that is that each line represents an individual, not a household. Uh, and that's great. So we have vastly more information than was available in 1840, but, but it's much uh, 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 very hard to screw up the columns. Um, and, um, but the problem is that uh, this made the tabulation much more difficult. Instead of having the enumerators in the field do all the, 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 the tabulation, the census returns came to Washington and they piled up there and they had to, they had to uh, tabulate them uh, every field by hand. Uh, and so they used these things they called spreadsheets. This is the one for the 188, or one of the ones for the 1880 census. There were seven different spreadsheets for the 1850 census, and they simply did tally marks. They'd go through, and then, and so they'd go through every page of the census at least seven times uh, uh, for the different uh, uh, spreadsheets uh, or condensing sheets, as they sometimes were called. Uh, and uh, so, 
To do this, the Census Office had to create a pop-up tabulation operation of unprecedented scale. By the end of 1851, the Washington office had a total of 170 staff, which was 10% of the whole federal workforce, uh, uh, and nine times the number that had been needed to process the 1840 census. And the tabulation work was not finished until 1859. Well, it got worse. From 19 peak office staff in 1840, 170 in 1850, by 1880 it was up to 1500. And the final census volume barely got done before preparations for the 1890 census had to begin. So uh, census superintendent and later governor of Minnesota, uh, William Rush Merriam said, it is clear that a point must be reached where complete tabulation before the next enumeration began would actually be impossible. So, to deal with this, the Census Office uh, held a competition. Uh, uh, and it was a competition to mechanize tabulation of the census. Uh, the 1889 census contest had three competitors, Charles F. Pigeon. He was the chief clerk of the Massachusetts Bureau of Labor Statistics. He developed a system where you, you, you had cardboard chips printed in different colors, uh, and you transcribe census information onto the chips using symbols to represent different characteristics, and then you could just sort the, the chips into different piles to make tables. Uh, and uh, then there was William C. Hunt, uh, he had worked on the 1885 Massachusetts census, uh, which uh, had uh, uh, the same kind of uh, layout. Uh, and uh, he offered a, a simplified, cheaper version of the pigeon system using paper slips uh, and colored inks rather than these chips. Uh, and then finally we had Herman Hollerith. Hollerith had worked for the census office uh, in 1880, on the 1880 census, um, and, and he developed a machine for electrical tabulation of cards uh, using holes punched in the cards. And so here's the results. They, they, uh, the, to test the systems, they had uh, a, a, a tabulation exercise of tabulating the 10,491 people from St. Louis. Uh, and Hollerith had the advantage in the transcription phase, which is making the punch cards or the slips or the chips. Uh, and, uh, you know, the hunt system was the cheapest one, but uh, it uh, was kind of slow. Uh, and Hollerith definitely had an advantage over the pigeon chips as well. But the, the real advantage of the Hollerith system was in the tabulation phase, where, uh, where uh, the tabulation went many times faster with the cards than the chips or the slips. And so overall, when you add everything up, uh, uh, Hollerith was more than twice as fast as the competitors. So, he made the cover of Scientific American, uh, and uh, on here you can see the main elements. This is the, 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 the uh, key punching machine, uh, which he called a pantograph, um, and uh, here's, uh, here's the tabulation engine. And I have some pictures here that I found at the Franklin Institute. Uh, uh, which, and I think that that's Hollerith himself at the, at the console there. Uh, but, but here's how it works. Uh, first, you in, in insert the punch card into the press. And to make the punch card, this is the pantograph, or, or as it was called, uh, the keyboard. Uh, uh, and you, you punch the holes uh, in, in, in the card with that. Uh, and then uh, you, you lower this thing that's kind of like a waffle iron. Uh, the, the, it's called a pin box, uh, and uh, so there's, uh, uh, on the lower left, that's from the patent diagram, and the upper left you can see like a cross section. So you had these, these little spring-loaded pins, and uh, where they saw a hole, where they'd go through a hole, they would go into a mercury cup, and uh, that would activate uh, uh, the electromagnetic uh, uh, dials on the left, uh, and then it would also uh, open a drawer, uh, a, a hole on the right, which is the sorting machine, so that uh, you could uh, sort the cards for the next tabulation. Uh, and so it worked pretty well. Um, 
And uh, so uh, this is, uh, in, in 1896, Hollerith uh, established the Tabulating Machine Company, and the 1900 census was processed with equipment leased from Hollerith uh, at considerable cost. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the, the machine that was used in, in 1900. Um, so Hollerith uh, uh, went on and st started finding markets in the um, in, in, in the business world. Uh, this is the Hollerith Type 3 machine built in 1921. Uh, and then in 1923, uh, uh, there's the Hollerith name, uh, uh, Hollerith uh, changed its name to the International Business Machines Corporation. And you can see they kept on making pretty much the same kind of machine. Uh, that's a 1933 model, the Type 285. Uh, ultimately, it culminated with the Model 407, which was the pinnacle of un unit record machines that came out in 1949. But I'm jumping ahead here. Uh, uh, now let me tell you about the census machine shop. So in 1902, the Census Bureau became a permanent organization. Uh, prior to that, it was a census office and it was closed down every 10 years and restarted from scratch every time. They decided that it made sense to keep things going uh, in between censuses and so they made the Census Bureau a permanent uh, 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 government agency. Uh, and uh, then in 1905, uh, uh, census Director North got $40,000 out of Congress to have the Census Bureau set up its own machine shop so that they could build uh, tabulating machines in direct competitions with, with Hollerith. The Hollerith patents were set to expire in 1906. Uh, and this was, I mean, this is an inconceivable thing that could never happen today. But keep in mind, you know, this was a progressive era. Roosevelt was, uh, uh, thought that Hollerith was a trust because the, uh, the, he had charged $400,000 uh, uh, to tabulate, uh, to rent his machines to, to the census office for the tabulating the 1900s. Census, and, and that was just absurd. So, um, so you know, they, the Congress spent this forty thousand dollars, and uh, of course, the Census Bureau hired the engineers directly from the Hollerith Company, uh, and uh, uh, by 1907 uh, had had uh, machines in production uh, and uh, were able to do the uh, the 1910. Uh, census on machines built by the census office. Uh, and, and to run the operation, they got this guy called James Powers. Uh, uh, and James Powers um, um, developed new punch card machines at the Census Bureau, uh, managed to get around the patents. Uh, and um, uh, then in, a year later, Powers left the Census Bureau to establish the Powers Accounting Machine Company. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, that was pretty successful. Uh, here's a 1934 ad for the Powers uh, punch card system, but Powers merged with a couple other companies and became Remington Rand Punch Card Accounting. Uh, and so um, another Census Bureau spinoff. So from 1910 to 1950, the Census Bureau just started building more and more machines. Uh, that were uh, constructed in their own machine shop. Here's a card sorter from 1920. Uh, there's the mechanical laboratory people working on building machines in the 1950s. Uh, here's a picture of tabulating the 1940 census, which was done all on, almost all on uh, Census Bureau built machines. Uh, and this is the last generation of Census Bureau tabulators being put together around 1950. But by 1950, uh, there was a change. Uh, IBM hired the Census Bureau's chief of machine tabulation, Lawrence Wilson, uh, in, in 1947. And then IBM came out with a new unit record machine, the Model 101, that combined the latest innovations in sorting and tabulation that had been developed at the Census Bureau Mechanical Laboratory. Uh, and then, of course, what happened was, this is a popular science from 1950, uh, is that uh, 
uh, the Census Bureau leased 32 of these machines using technology developed at the, by the Census Bureau, but which was effectively stolen by IBM. Uh, 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 and and this, this is the machine which popular science called a super duper census gadget. Uh, and uh, so, so it's kind of ironic that the, uh, the turnaround that the Census Bureau's appropriation of the Hollerith technology in 1907, by 1950, the Census Bureau paid the descendant of the Hollerith company for technology that had actually been developed by the Census Bureau. So, uh, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, well, in addition to Hollerith and Powers, there's a third revolutionary Census Bureau startup. Uh, in October 1946, uh, the uh, uh, creators of the experimental ENIAC machine, which was developed uh, right over here at the Moore School of Engineering, uh, 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 Mousley and Eckert received a contract from the Census Bureau to draw up plans for a Census Bureau computer, uh, and they used the funding to establish the Eckert Mousley Corporation, and uh, they uh, reached a agreement with the University of Pennsylvania that they would no longer be employed there, um, and uh, which is variously described. Uh, but anyway, with the Census Bureau backing, Eckert Mousley developed the first commercial electronic computer called Univac. Uh, which was completed in March 1951. It missed most of the tabulation for the 1950 census, uh, and it really wasn't much good anyway. But um, uh, at any rate, by the time it was delivered, uh, the Univac had been purchased by, guess who? Remington Rand. So this is all getting uh, very confusing. So uh, let me just give you a little genealogy of, of data processing. So in the beginning, there was census. And census begat Hollerith. And Hollerith combined with two other companies to become the computing tabulating recording company, which became the International Business Machines Corporation. And then census begat the Powers Accounting Machine Company, which combined with the Remington typewriter and Rand Ledger to make Remington Rand. Finally, census begat Eckert Mouchley, which created Univac, which was purchased by Remington Rand. And so the two largest computer companies of the second half of the 20th century uh, that dominated computing at, in that era, both were indirectly spin-offs from the Census Bureau. Okay, Fosdick. Um, so by 1950, tabulation was a mature technology. It was fast, it was really efficient and whatnot, but there was a new bottleneck, and the new bottleneck was the punch card. Here's a key punch operator from the 1950 census. Uh, so the, the, the population and housing components of the 1950 census required about 22 gigabytes of data storage, and so these were stored on 282 million 80 column cards weighing 600 tons that would make a stack 31 miles tall. And these cards, they were fragile, they were bulky, they were expensive to create, they, they, uh, they, they, they went moldy all the time, they, they, uh, and, and, and they were simply, uh, uh, data management was, was a, 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 a challenge. So computers offered the potential for a solution. This is the uh, Univac 1105 at Census. All the tabulation of the 1960 Census was done on this machine, uh, and, and it was a completely practical computer, unlike the Univac 1. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, I mean, it broke down a lot, but, but it got the job done. And as you can see, this is the picture I showed you before, tabulating the 1940 census on the left. Uh, there's the census computer on the right. They just stuck the thing in, in the same room where they had had the, uh, the unit record machines uh, 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 before. Um, but um, at any rate, um, the, the problem was how do you get the, uh, the data onto computer tape? without punch cards? And the answer was the film optical sensing device for input to computers. This was the first high-speed optical mark recognition system ever designed. 
uh, and uh, this is the 1960 census form. Uh, it's a bubble sheet, just like uh, you have for your SATs or GREs or what have you. Uh, and uh, here's the uh, uh, a close up of the clothes washing machine question ringer or springer? Spinner, <laughs> automatic or semi-automatic, and so on. So, so the enumerators actually filled this out. So, the uh, uh, enumerators responsible uh, for uh, uh, filling in the, the bubbles, uh, and then they were microfilmed, and then and the microfilm, as you can see here, was fed into the uh, Fosdick machine, and uh, it was uh, read with uh, 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 a electrical eye. Uh, and the little bubbles could be interpreted. And it was extremely fast uh, and um, was uh, a marvelous machine um, and got rid of punch cards altogether. Um, so uh, in 1970, uh, you could see this is the, the logo for 1970 and it, it shows somebody filling in one of those little uh, 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 little holes. Well, the big innovation in 1970 was they didn't have the enumerators fill in the little bubbles. That was the way the data was collected. This was the form that, that somebody got that you got in the mail, you know, and uh, uh, they, they, it was a mail out, mail back census. Uh, uh, so you received this form in the, in the mail and then the, the uh, respondent was responsible for filling in the little circles with a number two pencil. Uh, and uh, so uh, what happened uh, <coughs> was really, I mean, this is kind of in some ways a throwback to like 1790. You got uh, the, 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 the mechanics of, of data capture, the hard part, now is being actually done by the respondents. You know, and they, 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 uh, they fill in this, these little holes and uh, um, uh, that's the main work involved in data capture. So here's the envelope that, uh, you sent back, here's your census form. Um, so um, then in 19, oh, in 1970, another big innovation was the automatic sh uh, sheet turning machine so that they, uh, they could actually, you know, for the long form, which had many pages, they, 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 it can turn all the pages. They use that little brush there to, to flip the pages over the booklet and uh, 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 automate the, uh, uh, the the filming. I've actually seen a video. There's a video of this, and it's quite a quite a Rube Goldberg Goldberg uh, device, but it it worked. Okay, 1980 and 1990, mostly incremental changes. Fosdick was uh, refined, made electronic. Uh, uh, the mechanical aspects of it went away, and it became effectively a computer. And it was super fast. Uh, it would do. Uh, uh, 200 frames, uh, 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 let's, yeah, it's 200 frames a minute uh, that, that it, would, it would read. So 200 sheets, uh, sides of a enumeration form. Um, and, uh, um, you know, they got the filming automated and better, and so it was just, uh, but it was, uh, it was pretty incremental change. Um, so, our final era privatization. So for most of the 20th century, the federal government expanded the scope of its activities. You got the New Deal, you got the interstate highways, uh, you've got uh, big educations in health and education, anti-poverty initiatives uh, culminating in the Great Society. And, and uh, this, of course, came under attack in the 1980s. Reagan believed that the private sector was inherently more efficient than the public sector, uh, and he campaigned uh, uh, to privatize government functions. In his first inaugural address, Reagan famously asserted that government is not the solution to the problem, uh, government is the problem. So there was a democratic majority uh, in, in both houses uh, uh, during the Reagan administration, and. Uh, they were committed to uh, preserving the achievements of the New Deal and the Great Society, and so privatization had minimal consequences during the Reagan administration. But President Clinton had a much bigger impact. He campaigned in 1992 on a third-way platform of shrinking the federal government. 
he proposed to cut 100,000 unnecessary bureaucratic posi positions. But then once he got into office, his reinventing government initiative actually expanded its goal to 272,000 jobs. So this is what it looks like if you look at uh, executive branch employment, this doesn't include the military, uh, 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 per million population. And, and you can see there's a little drop off in the, in the Carter years, about 10% decline. Uh, in, in, in the federal employment. Uh, but then it's kind of stable for Reagan and Bush, uh, Bush the first, uh, and then just falls off a cliff uh, um, in, uh, in the Clinton years. And so uh, the, the uh, um, and since then there hasn't been that much change. There's a little bump up during the Great Recession. I think that uh, it's, it's probably gone, gone back down. Um, so, as planning uh, in the 1990s was ramping up for the Census 2000, there was intense pressure to identify functions that could be outsourced to private vendors. Uh, and so there was a new approach. Uh, uh, in 1996, uh, after, after 90 years, the uh, census machine shop was closed and they fired almost all the engineers. Uh, and so they decided to outsource to military contractors. Uh, and uh, uh, the main designer uh, of the system uh, was Lockheed Martin. The DCS 2000 is Data Capture System 2000. Uh, and uh, the actual operations were operated by another defense contract contractor, uh, uh, TRW. Uh, so they didn't use FOSDIC. Uh, they just scanned the paper forms uh, 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 with these Kodak scanners. Uh, and then they used optical mark recognition and OCR to interpret the handwritten responses. And then they hired an army of clerical staff to manually enter the forms uh, that couldn't be interpreted by a machine, which there were a lot of. Uh, and, and so these things were about 1 40th the speed of the FOSDIC machines. So they had to the set up centers all around the country to handle the flow of paper. Uh, and um, they didn't begin testing the imaging systems until 1998. And it was immediately clear that it wasn't working. Uh, the software development was much slower than anticipated. A lot of milestones were missed over the next 16 months. And then in February 2000, less than two months before data capture was supposed to begin, the General Accounting Office found that there were still 120 critical defects in the software and hardware. And even more troubling, the number of known critical problems was actually going up was increasing over time. And so it was down to the wire. They did manage to get things to work adequately, not well, but adequately uh, at the last minute. Uh, the cost was much higher than anticipated, about a half a billion in the end, about five times the original estimate. But 2000 went very well compared to 2010. Now in 2010, we moved the long form over to the American Community Survey so that the, the, the main census that went out to the whole population only had nine questions. Uh, and so uh, you'd think that since in the previous ones the long form accounted for half the cost of the census that things would have gotten better, but it didn't. Uh, there were new technology failures. Uh, the um, um, most important of these was the failure of the Harris device. As Waxman pointed out, it was a colossal failure. So uh, uh, it was a $3 billion information technology failure, probably the biggest uh, software development failure in history in terms of its cost. And this is the machine that caused it. This is the Harris device that was supposed to be used for non-response follow-up. Uh, and Harris had a contract of $650 million to build these devices. Uh, he built them, but they didn't work. The software didn't work, so it was canceled uh, in, in uh, 2008. And uh, they, they reverted to paper forms at the last minute. Uh, this, this machine, this particular machine is still 
the, there's a display case at the Census Bureau that's got all their, you know, a whole bunch of historical artifacts, and this is proudly displayed. Uh, and even though it, it, it is the core, it's the source of considerable embarrassment. Uh, uh, but you know, in 2010, the Brazilians did it. The Brazilians did it for 200. They got 225,000 uh, 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 smartphones from LG for $42 million, and they did the whole enumeration with it, not just the non-response follow-up. They did all the enumeration, and they have the longest long form of any country in the world. They've got uh, a huge number of questions, uh, and uh, they still had no problem. Now, the other big fail failure in 2010 was the internet response option. Um, uh, there, there actually had been an internet response option in 2000, and that's shown here. Uh, it wasn't widely publicized, only about 80,000 people responded to the census that way in 2000. But it was supposed to be a core component of the 2010 census. It was supposed to be the main, the main tool for information gathering. Um, uh, but um, there was a successful test of the website uh, in, in 2005, uh, but then uh, uh, the, the project was uh, canceled. The, the Census Bureau said that they were concerned about phishing and data security, but the real problem is the contractor couldn't promise to get the website functional in time for the 2008 dress rehearsal of the census, and so uh, they just canceled it. Uh, Canada had no trouble in, in 2006. In 2011, 54% of Canadian responses came from the internet. Um, so the failure to implement an internet response option in 2010 probably cost about a billion dollars. Okay, so let's look at the cost. This is the usual way of measuring it, cost per household. Uh, and uh, you can see that actually the cost went down from 1940 to 1960. Uh, the drop to 1950 is probably mostly a result of much increased use of sampling in 1950 compared to 1940. They put most things on the sample line uh, instead of the, the, uh, the, the regular uh, line and reduced the quantity of information they collected dramatically. And then in 1960, it dropped again, probably computerization, FOSDIC, um, you know, there were a number of innovations, then, then it started going up, and it, there was particularly large increases from 70 to 80, and, and then from 80 to 92, and, and, and from 80 to 90, the uh, quality also deteriorated slightly. Uh, but as you can see, there, were, there was then a very large increase in 2000, and another big increase in 2010. Well, now in 2010, of course, they were collecting a lot less information. There's a lot less uh, uh, in, uh, involved. So if we measure the cost per item of information collected, you can see just what, what a disaster 2010 was. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the cost of the census uh, almost tripled between 2000 and 2010, after more than doubling uh, between 1990 and 2000. So, how about 2020? Well, both the new technologies are planned, both the internet response option and the uh, handheld uh, uh, devices. Uh, um, uh, but the technology is not ready. Um, the GAO has uh, uh, issued multiple warnings uh, um, they considered the 2020 census to be at high risk. At this time, the Bureau has not achieved the level of institutional maturity needed to reliably bring these solutions to bear. The Bureau lacks well-established IT management and security controls. A high degree risk, uh, uh, of risk and uncertainty exists. Uh, so, the, the Census Bureau is planning, in addition, the biggest technological reboot in its history, replacing almost all the software used in, in data capture and processing. Uh, and of course, this is being, the software is no longer written in the Census Bureau, it's being written by defense contractors. So uh, here's a few recent headlines and press organs that follow the government. Uh, uh, um, Security weaknesses, uh, uh, big problems, um, 
Uh, cost estimates are not reliable. Uh, Census Bureau fumbles and NextGov. Uh, Fed scoop, 2020 census isn't out of the woods yet. Uh, and uh, uh, lawsuits, uh, obviously, over the, over the uh, citizenship question and other things. Uh, and of course, we have the lesson of healthcare.gov. Uh, so, um, shortly after we put up a, a working paper on this topic, uh, uh, we got an email from a guy at the Census Bureau who <laughs> said he's the last surviving uh, Fosdick engineer at the Census Bureau. He didn't want to reveal his identity. I mean, he revealed it to us, but he, uh, we know who, 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 who he is. Uh, but he uh, wanted us to keep his comments confidential. But uh, he, he's, he, he says he's been struggling to figure out what happened in the 1990s. Um, and uh, he does think that our description of the current state of affairs is pretty accurate. But he thinks that there is a darker side and that uh, the, the near violent purge of in-house engineering uh, now seems tantamount to institutional suicide. He's got much more to say. Very interesting character. But um, uh, at any rate, we are continuing to interview him. OK, so conclusions. Um, from the late 19th century to the late 20th century, the US Census was the world leader in the development and application of large-scale data processing uh, uh, technology. Uh, uh, and the, 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 the Census Bureau's efforts had uh, uh, numerous spin-offs uh, that I haven't talked about. Uh, uh, you know, the, the punch card business accounting uh, was, was, was huge. Uh, um, uh, and, you know, the, the well, the development of computers, that was a pretty big deal. Uh, and, and, and things like the first digital street maps that were uh, invented by the Census Bureau in 1966. Um, but in the 1990s, Census Bureau lost its leadership because of the privatization due to political uh, pressure. And, and this was not, never was, a cost-saving measure. It was totally uh, uh, a response to political pressures uh, uh, of the day. Uh, and uh, it was not successful. Um, and in, in, in broader perspective, I think the costs of privatizing census data capture are bigger than just the increased expense of operating the census. We've also lost an important element of our shared institutional capital. And, and I think the political tides will shift again, but at the Census Bureau, and, and this is really, this happened across the federal government, not just at the Census Bureau, this is just one case. Uh, it's gonna be hard to rebuild the, the capabilities that the storms of privatizations have swept away. Uh, and so that is my conclusion. Thank you. In the description of the competition that Hollerith won, you gave figures on speed. You didn't mention anything about quality or error rates. And in general, in, in the discussion, you uh, clearly optical scanning has some error problems and so on. Um, did they not focus on errors at all? Or? I have not seen any. Uh, I, I don't think they, they were concerned about it. I mean, uh, uh, when you read about the contest, nobody mentions that. <laughs> I mean, it does seem like you, you would you would think that they they. Uh, Giving your result about the insane blacks and that was caused by an error. Right. Absolutely. Um, Two questions. One is um, with uh, the original technology, the film reading device. So it turns out, from what you're saying, that that's way more. Um, accurate than OCR? No. It, it, it doesn't actually do, it, it's OMR. Oh. So it only does marks. The, and so one of the big promises of uh, going to the optical scanners was that they could actually use OCR 
and try to read the the uh, the printing, which in 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 two th since it's 2000, you know, you're supposed to put the uh, 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 you know print and block letters and stuff like that. And you know that didn't work very well in 2000. And it didn't. I think it worked a little better in 2010. That's an area where it's gotten much much better handwriting recognition effectively uh, and where there is potential for uh, improvement but of course if we if we manage to get the data capture mostly done by internet response and and handhelds there is no need for scanning at all anymore it's natively in digital format so this was so fascinating and I want to know a little bit more about a couple of things so you use the comparisons of countries Brazil and in a couple of moments to kind of make the case that the U.S. maybe was unique in terms of its way of privatization, but we know that the neoliberal turn also took place in other countries as well. So, like, what what were Brazil and Canada doing that it worked better in their case? Like, they managed to incorporate technology, but but didn't but didn't do it at the cost and at the kind of like market failure that, or like business failure. Yeah, and and in fact, Lockheed yeah. Martin has. Uh, you know, been selling their census services abroad as well. I think oh. the UK census, they they did a lot of the data capture, uh, uh, which uh, seems like a bad idea. Uh, but um, it does seem like the US w was uh, particularly bad. <laughs> And whether that's due to management, uh, mismanagement of the contracts. I mean, the federal contracting system, I think, is broken. Uh, and maybe that's better in other countries. I don't know. Um, uh, but it, yes, it, a comparative study would be pretty interesting to see what did, what did Canada and Brazil do right. Uh, 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 I know Australia had a disaster, right? Uh -huh. They had a, a, a complete collapse of their 2011 census uh, and, and it was due to contracting. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the, the second question which is I think is very related to this is like what is the role with like what, why are these privatization happening through the military subcontractors? Like what is the story there? Like, I think that the reason why they're particularly competitive is because they know they're beltway bandits. They know the contract, the federal contracting system, and we've got billion-dollar contracts. Most people just don't have the capability of applying for them. Okay. You know, uh, and the, the the they they may not be very good at doing stuff, but they're good at making the proposals. <laughs> so, so, Steve, let me let me ask you one question and then make a short speech. Um, <laughs> so, the, so the one question is, you know, at the end you sort of say, you know, the whole thing was, I, I remember two words, purely ideological. So my question is, in a sense, and then I'll make this quick speak, in some ways it, the ideology is just a facade over essentially um, looting. I mean, it's just a way of transferring public wealth to private hands. And now my speech is, is very much, it's very interesting seeing all this from the historical perspective because for anything in the here and now, we tend to think, oh, why is this and that? But, you know, you told the history of the census. You might just as well have been telling the history of the United States. I mean, the, the, the whole thing, what I, I couldn't be, help but be struck during the 60s that at the same time that technology was going on, you know, we were, build, we were putting a man on the moon with the same technology. And is there anyone in this room who thinks if we went to put a man on the moon now, that it wouldn't cost a fortune and lots of people would be killed as the things exploded, you know, <laughs> from the private contractors. I mean, seriously, would any of you get one of those things? <laughs> uh, so that's my speech. I mean, it's not a, it's just, you know, the whole thing is just uh, beyond sobering. It's intoxicating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't mean to stop. <laughs> no, I mean, what's the connection is, uh, between the contents of the census and also the move to the ACS? Because it, the, the sad part of this whole thing is that they refuse to add questions to the census. For and To give an example, I always think that the question about place of birth of the parents and grandparents is a good question. Oh, yeah. I always tell you we cannot do it. Maybe this is informal. We cannot do it because it costs too much. Well, and also because they've, uh, they've adopted uh, this ideology that you, they cannot 
they say, ask any questions that are not mandated by some statute. Uh, that are not, uh, you know, when they, uh, that's the argument they use, uh, and, uh, you know, you could easily make uh, the case that you need parental birthplace uh, uh, for any number of public policy purposes, but, uh, no, they... Uh, uh, no, I think there's another story to that as well. The Census Bureau did recommend the place of birth question to OMB when Bob Ross was the director of the Census Bureau. Uh, the, and OMB turned it down. And my, what I've heard is that the Bureau made the recommendation, but Bob and Captain Woman mixed it because another question had to come off the census. And there's a big the lobbying for ancestry. Yeah, and there was a big lobbying for ancestry. <laughs> Which is a terrible question. It is not a good question. So that makes it, and now the scientists, you know, we recommend it. But there, there is increasing pressure to take questions yeah. off. You know, we had the marriage, uh, marital history uh, right. thing a little while ago, and we lost, uh, and we lost children ever born. We lost, uh, 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 you know. But yes, that they still a huge push to try to get the ancestry question. The ancestry. I mean, not get the uh, get the place of the question on the census. But but it used to be that the 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 content of the census was uh, was done in very close consultation with the academic community. The American Statistical Association, in particular, you know, really designed most of the 20th century census forms, uh, uh, and 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 the particularly the enormous expansion of the questionnaire in 1940. Uh, you know, this was the, the academics who did it. The academic, I mean, one of the other things that, about the Census Bureau that's happened is that if you look at um, the, the early years of the PAA, um, most of the presidents of the PAA were either former census directors or current census directors in some instances, or had spent a big part of their career at census before going into academia. And if you look at the last uh, 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 40 years, there are no PAA pres uh, presidents that have any significant census experience. And so the, the, the oh, census Bureau. Suzanne, give her, come on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's make it 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they, it's, become, it's become rare. Uh, and uh, I think that. Um, you know, it's part of the same thing. The, the Census Bureau is not full of academics anymore. It was full of, of the, the leading demographers of the, of the, 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 the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and, and 60s. Uh, you know, many of the leading demographers were at the Census Bureau. And now within the Census Bureau, there's just no big constituency of people pushing for like additional questions or trying to get the academic community to uh, uh, um, you know, uh, help them f figure out what to ask. And they don't pay any attention to CSAC either, which doesn't have any academics on it anymore to speak of. Yeah. <laughs> that's true of lots of uh, government uh, research kind of enumeration agencies that uh, the, the, you know, it's not a pathway in and out of academia anymore. Like the Bureau of Justice Statistics yeah. has no statistician on their staff now. I mean, that's kind of crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess many countries are moving actually away from census to going to, you know, transfer data and so on. And then also, you know, some other country actually tries to use a different way of dealing with this issue. But it, I'm, I expect that in the U.S. it's very difficult actually to get this registered data. But is there any, like, you know, the discussions within Census Bureau whether fundamentally you know, challenges the questions about like whether do we really need the census? Well, I mean, obviously, the census is in the Constitution. We need the census because unless you want to amend the Constitution, um, and uh, you know that's hard. <laughs> um, uh, so, so the but but they've. I mean, it's been stripped down, so it's 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 seven questions now, um, and and um, uh, you know it's uh, uh, pretty pretty minimal. Um, the uh, and the American Community Survey is a little bit more 
like a, a, a continuous measurement thing. I mean, it is continuously enumerated, uh, but um, yeah, there's a there there is this paranoid streak uh, in uh, American uh, uh, politics that. Um, I think makes, uh, you know, any move towards a register-based system would be extremely unpopular and difficult to, uh, uh, you know, they would, they, they would say, be, you know, it would all be Big Brother and... Um, there is a move to use administrative records for the 2020 census, though. If they can enumerate all the households and uh, follow up, you know, they, they go to their houses to try to get people to answer that. If they can, there is some move towards using um, records, and especially for the non-response followers. Well, listen, uh, let's, uh, not this exactly, but we'll continue with other matters uh, later this afternoon, or later Great. Steve, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.